let's see if this works. Can you see a screen? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm going to be looking off, you know, off instead of looking at you, I'm sorry, because I've got a two screen set up and the one, the one with the camera is not the one where I've got the presentation going. Um, so I may miss if, if hands go up. Um, it, so feel free to, to shout out and interrupt me if I don't spot that someone wants to ask something on the way. Will do. Um, right. So the Bristol Pound really started um, as a result of the transition movement. I think it was in 2003 that if you were busy looking at pie charts of oil use, you might have noticed that the chunk of the, well, the section of the pie for transportation overtook the section of the pie on production for the first time. And so people really started to think, wow, if we want to reduce our carbon use globally, then what we should be doing is trying to localize. Um, and um, Lewis and Totnes got going first, really, around this idea of a currency that would help to encourage localization. We were a little bit behind that. We, we really came on board after the financial crash um, in 2008. Um, and we were thinking as well as about the oil thing, we were thinking about, I say we very, very generally, because I wasn't part of this. I came on board in 2018, by the way. Um, but you know, we as a team, if you like, the Bristol Pound team, um, we're thinking about how do you make local economies more resilient? And again, localization seems to be one of the keys where um, you're trying to stop leakage of money outside the local economy. And obviously with things like big supermarkets, big global chains on the high street, you know, a little bit of the money goes to pay the wages of the people in the shop and maybe the rent to the local landlord and local taxes on that property. But everything else is going out to global supply chains, to head offices, to um, shareholders all over the world. Um, and the you know, there's not much being reinvested. Whereas if you can keep that money within the local economy and also make the money circulate around the system faster, you know, there's this idea of velocity that um, you know, money is only doing something useful when it's moving. And if it's moving fast around a closed system, we can get something called the local multiplier effect to, um, you know, to sort of power up local economy. So those were the, the key ideas. We had this vision that we would be creating a resilient, inclusive and sustainable city economy through the Bristol Pound um, uh, currency, um, localizing supply chains to reduce transport emissions, trapping wealth in the local economy where it could be reinvested to create better opportunities for people. It would be a great network for small businesses um, working together, sharing sharing their problems and you know, working together. It would help to keep our, um, our local area feeling unique and vibrant um, with um, maybe fewer chain stores and more independent stores. Um, and that once we'd got this licked in, in Bristol, we would have something that we could roll out to other big cities because no other, no other place at the point we did this had tried to create a local currency on a city scale. There were lots of small towns or, you know, um, or as well, there were kind of um, communities of, of mutual concern that had maybe tried to set up um, currencies. But the idea of setting up something that was across everything at a citywide level was pretty new at the time. Um, so the idea was that individuals could buy the local currency. By the way, we had not only notes, but also um, a digital um, form of money right from the get-go. Um, so you, individuals could, could, in effect, purchase that money um, either through, through you know, online or, um, you know, through, um, or by going along to one of our many partners in the city where they could just swap sterling for the pretty paper money. And then once they had that money, they could only spend it with the business members. And the business members, to be a business member, you had to be a local independent business um, based in Bristol uh, and serving mainly Bristol. Um, so here's a rough timeline. We got that idea in, in 2009, took a couple of years to, to kind of get our, get our act together and design all of that infrastructure and the, you know, both the technical aspects and the paper aspects and regulation and everything. And we finally launched in 2012. We grew really rapidly. And I think we were very lucky with this. We had a couple of things that really helped. One was that at the time we were launching, Bristol had its first independent mayor. 
Um, and I think that that you know there's a kind of zeitgeist of Bristol being very independent, very powerful, uh, and very celebratory of everything that was Bristolian, you know. Uh, and as well, we were successful. I think actually one of the reasons the city was successful in getting the European Green Capital bid was because we were having our own local currency that played very well into that application. But also all of that um, publicity that the European green capital um, status got the city really helped the, the currency as well. So it was you know, a symbiotic uh, relationship. We kind of peaked in 2016, 2015, 2016, and then there was a, a kind of decline and it was in 2018 when they were going, you know, basically a, a lot of the original team walked away. You know, there were, I'm writing a book, um, which, you know, hopefully a year from now you'll be able to, to buy, um, but uh, which really explains some of the dynamics that were going on, uh, you know, over that, over that difficult period. But anyway, I was brought in and that, you know, basically a clean slate, um, a new team, very, a very reduced team because we had very little money by then. And my brief was, please, can you save the Bristol pound? Well, I, I had a look at what was going wrong. I, I tried to. Uh, we did a bit of a relaunch in 2019, but really it was too little too late. Um, and I'll go into some of the reasons about you know, why that decline happened, why the relaunch couldn't work, why I couldn't fix it. So the paper currency ended in 2020, oh, sorry, the digital currency ended in 2020 and the, the final notes, which Brendan was just waving at you, um, expired in 2021. I mean, in reality, I would say that with COVID, um, use of the paper money disappeared pretty much instantly anyway. There was a feeling that, um, you know, I don't know, touching banknotes could spread the disease. I mean, I think in retrospect, we know that it wasn't really spread by touch. It was spread by, by um, what's the word, atmospheric, you know, by tiny, teeny tiny drop of, what's it called? Aerosol, it's aerosol transmission. But anyway, whatever, we, you know, it, it had an impact on us. So yeah, there was this really promising start at the beginning in 2012. It, it was really cool. I mean, you guys, you're so young, you really won't understand this, but a mobile phone, you know, the idea of going out and paying with a mobile phone, it, well, that was novel. You know, smartphones didn't really exist at this point. They were just in their very infancy. Um, and, it, you know, so it was the, the only way you could pay by your phone in Bristol. So it had that kind of cool factor. We were the first um, um, local currency to launch with both digital and paper money. And we were the first that had managed to work closely with the council, such that the council was prepared to accept payment of local taxes in the currency. So there were a lot of firsts. It was very world breaking. We got a, you know, got a load of um, uh, publicity. And for a, for a local currency, you know, having within three years, you know, 1,300 individual members and nearly 600 businesses, you know, this was huge and, and a million pounds circulating. It, you know, for a local currency, that was, that was wow. I'd just like to put it into perspective. Um, we're talking something like 0.2% um, of Bristol's population actually showing an interest and in using, you know, trying to set up an account or something. And of, of those, only 10%, so 0.02% of Bristol's population actually using the currency um, at all with any regularity at all. So um, it was teeny, teeny, tiny, although it looked good for a local currency. So did we did we uh, succeed in creating local loops in you know localizing supply chains? Um, I mean, I think we didn't have access to any of this data at the time, but in retrospect, we have been able to have a um, some. There, there were a lot of data protection problems that stopped us looking at the data directly, but eventually we managed to get um, the right for an academic to look at the, some of the data, uh, at least the business to business data. And, you know, he, he found that, yes, um, there were some loops. It's hard to say whether they were loops that already existed that were made visible by the currency or whether they were really new. We also found that, you know, having a wide variety of businesses was important in creating those loops. And in particular, that sort of cross-cutting services like maybe cleaners or accountants that work across many different businesses were, were key to helping those loops to develop. Um, 
And here are some pretty pictures showing kind of in, in 2013, you know, these, the, the dots of the businesses and then the, the, the connections are showing, you know, who they were paying money to. Uh, and you can see that gradually, you know, that, that complexity grew. By 2016, every business was, was, part, you know, was properly connected to the main core. But even by 2017, you've got some kind of outliers that are no longer connected and there's a gradual fragmentation and loss of, of nodes until by 2019, you know, we're almost back to back to those early days. Um, so yeah, that's the rise and fall. Did we change behavior? I mean, that's a, you know, another question, did, did it work? And what we asked people um, in about, I think it was in 2019, we did this research. We asked people, you know, to what extent had they changed various behaviors after they started using the Bristol pound? Now, a lot of these we would expect them to do, right? We would expect them to uh, change where they shop. We would expect them to have switched energy provider because that's one of the things that, that you know, we had an energy provider that was on the, on the scheme. However, we wouldn't necessarily have expected them to switch their bank. That wasn't part of the ask or to have begun growing food or keeping chickens, which, which is this line here, or buying secondhand goods. So we were having, we were, I think, to a certain extent, helping to wake up in people, um, you know, a, a wider understanding of their, their impact through their economic activity. Similarly with businesses, we'd expect them to change their pur purchasing policies, but some of them also changed their HR policies, which wasn't particularly required by us or moved their bank account. So we feel like we were having some impact on, on both businesses and individuals. So I guess the big question is, how come we had this meteoric rise at first and everyone's like, wow, look what's going on in Bristol. This is incredible. They're doing something so right. How come that then just stalled and, and then went downhill? Um, and I think really the problem here is about marketing. Um, we were Marmite. I mean, none of you are, are British, so so you won't really understand this. We have this this um, savoury spread to put on toast called Marmite in the UK, which some people love. I mean, it's like Vegemite in, if you're from Australia. Um, some people love it and some people just think it is the most disgusting thing. Um, and so we appealed to people who really liked what we were doing. And we didn't appeal at all to people who didn't like what we were doing. And our marketing at the beginning, and I think this is common for a lot of, you know, any fintech startup you know that you focus first on the easy easy to get you know, the early adopters and to do that we we honed some marketing spiel that was really focused on people who thought just like us it sounded very campaigning uh it was kind of like don't shop at tesco's you know tesco's is is evil you know that they're not helping our local economies they don't care about us it was very passionate and it, it you know, sounded judgmental. And, and if you're someone who, you know, Tesco's is your local store, you're living on limited funds and, you know, you haven't got a load of time to go around the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and maybe pay over the odds for the goods that you can get very cheaply in Tesco. Um, you know, we, we sounded like we were dissing them in some way. Um, and so we alienated a lot of normal people. We alienated a lot of bigger businesses. Um, at best, we seemed irrelevant to many, many people, you know, to, to participate in this you know, local currency thing. You had to have spare time and money on your hands. You had to understand these weird economic arguments like local multiplier effect and leakage. And, and even if you believe you, you understood those arguments, you had to believe it would work. And, and, you know, I had a lot of conversations with people saying, yeah, it's a nice idea. I can see what you're trying to do. But, you know, I, I can't be bothered because I know it's not going to work. It's just never going to get to the right scale to actually do anything. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to bother. Um, and here is some data which perhaps underlines this problem. You know, if we look at our members in 2014, 40, 40, 44 percent of them had PhDs or other postgraduate degrees. You know, this is not this is not normal <laughs> cross section of society. Uh, you know, and, and um, over 80% um, you know, um, had had a degree at all. Again, it's just not at all normal. Um, most of them, I think this was about um, seven, I'm, I'm trying to remember without, um, you know, I haven't got the data precisely in my head, but around 70% were professional 
or managers, you know, so they had a good level of income. Um, and the ones who were not working, this kind of whatever percent it was here, fifteen percent or something, they were um, they were mainly older people who were retired, not young students. Um, you know, they were people who who kind of had the that luxury um, of being able, you know, having the time to shop around and things. We didn't really have a value proposition for anybody, um, so people would say to me. Um, well, what do I get if I join the Bristol Pound? Do I get like, you know, like my club card at Tesco? Do I get cash back? Do I get, you know, buy six, get one free? Do I, you know, and without that kind of loyalty scheme, for most people who are thinking within the current paradigm, they couldn't really see the point of it. For businesses, we thought we had um, a value proposition because what we said to them is, hey, you know, there's this brand new currency, join our scheme. And there'll be all these people really wanting to spend their you know, trendy, new, pretty money. And they're going to be hunting out the local businesses where they can spend this money. So if you join us, it's like a, a marketing boost for your business. You'll have increased footfall and, you know, you'll be more profitable. It'll be amazing. And so a lot of businesses um, did join up on that basis. But what we found out when we asked them afterwards, you know, when things were in decline or when they were leaving, you know, when the businesses were deciding to leave, um, we said, well, you know, didn't didn't lots of people come? And they said, no, no. Basically, some of our existing uh, customers just changed to pay with this slightly more annoying money um, that's harder for us to process. So um, we didn't really have a reason for people to join them that made sense. We had no value propositions. We also had really dreadful um, tech um, and regulatory issues. Um, we needed, we were using Cyclos, which is, you may have come across it, it it's um, it's software used by a lot of mutual credit, like um, I think it was used by Sardex, the Sardinian um, mutual credit scheme, um, and by various other um, local currency schemes around the world. Um, but the problem was, because we were trying to do this at city scale and have major stakeholders like the city council involved, we needed it to be regulated. Um, you know, we couldn't just say this is a teeny tiny thing and you can you know, join in if you want to. We were trying to really publicize this as, you know, uh, credible and um, legitimate. Um, so we needed to choose a partner who could give us that regulated status in the UK. And we chose the local credit union because they were socially aligned to what we were trying to do. However, the credit union, like us, were a teeny tiny organization with pretty much no money to spend on tech. The end result was we had you know this um, complicated system with the Cyclos front end, you know customer facing front end here and the back end at the Bristol Credit Union over here and they needed to have a kind of batch update process every night to to um, reconcile against each other. So if you put some money into the BCU back end, you probably couldn't see it in your in your Cyclos Bristol Pound account for like thirty six hours. You know it's just um the and by this stage you know in in yeah let, let's say you know we're, we're now moving on a bit so 2014 2015 where it's going into decline and by this stage apple pay already exists and people are used to a, a you know um oh i'll just download you know monzo and upload a bit of money and i'll be using it in 10 minutes you know they had very slick stuff whereas um you know for us it would take about 10 days and loads of emails and maybe even going along to the credit union with your council tax statement to prove who you were to actually get the account off the ground. So it was extremely clunky. It didn't really work for businesses as well who, who had maybe more than one till or more than one shop in the city because um, Cyclos didn't, didn't have, maybe it does by now, I don't know, but at that stage we didn't have a till reference on there. So it was very difficult for them to reconcile their tills. Um, and the, the key thing was because the credit union were the regulated um, body, they owned the data. So I could never look at, we could never look at the transaction data. We couldn't see which businesses are you know, taking money in and spending it on, which businesses are taking money in and then just extracting it to sterling because they can't be bothered to change their supply chains. You know, we couldn't work out where to intervene um, at points of leverage to improve the functioning of the of the um, of the currency, 
but I think bigger than this, we there was something we didn't really understand about small businesses. In effect, what we were saying to small businesses is, please uh, use this more difficult money, which will you know, make your till processes more annoying. Uh, and also, please change your supply chains. And um, you know, both of those are big. You know, on the supply chain side, if you've got a business and it's actually working and you're a small business, you, know, you don't go around changing your supply chain. You know, why would you bring in that risk um, willingly? Um, because your business, your product is only as good as the supplies you get in, right? You know, if you're making the best chocolate brownies in Bristol and then you change your cocoa and chocolate supplier, um, especially given you know that the cocoa and the chocolate isn't really coming from Bristol, you know, it's coming from the other side of the world. So the carbon thing didn't quite make sense to, to people in that kind of situation. And they're thinking, why would I you know, change to this other supplier just because it's a Bristol-based wholesaler rather than my current London-based wholesaler? You know, it didn't make sense. And if they were changing supplier, frankly, they're gonna have a load of things on their, on their you know, tick list for like, well, what's the lead time? What's the price like? What's the quality like? Was it method of payment? No, that's that's not even on their list really of things to consider. And you know, the front end having to train all those staff on well, this is how you accept the paper money. You've got to look at the, you know, is it the right um version? Because the notes were were reprinted every three years and they fell out of uh, you know, they expired basically. So it, then or are they playing paying by SMS text or are they paying using the new app and they might have different tills on the buttons on the till to process each sort of money? You know, it's just a lot of stuff for them to take on and getting their bookkeepers you know to manage cash flow on two different accounts you know it's it's just um it, there were more um far more um costs than benefits to businesses joining the currency so um i had to take the decision you know having tried a bit of a relaunch and it not really working and having understood these problems by talking to a lot of the businesses I started to think, what could we do next? And I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes talking about um, the concepts behind City Pay or Bristol Pay as its first um, uh, iteration, we hoped, uh, which I never actually managed to get funding for. I tried, oh, I, I tried, um, you know, government's innovation grants. I tried um, you know, third sector grant funders, you know, who are funding for social or environmental impact. I tried university research and they, you know, university researchers were very keen to have PhDs on this platform when I built it, but they couldn't help me build it. Um, I tried, you know, philanthropists and angel investors and stuff. I just couldn't find a way after three years of trying of getting it funded. So everything you're going to hear from here on in never happened, but I think the ideas are really powerful. And if I'm honest, I'm far more excited about the failure of something that never got off the ground than the, than the supposed success of Bristol Pound, which had a worldwide following and which everyone looked to as a kind of like, wow, look, look what they're doing in Bristol. So I started to think at the beginning of this, what, how do I make sure it works? Um, the first thing was, is it must set a low bar for entry. With Bristol Pound, we had said, you know, if you're this woke and you understand this much about local economics and environmental blah de bar and whatever, you know, uh, new economic thinking, then you'll join the Bristol Pound. If you don't get it, then you won't. And as a result, you know, we attracted that 0.02% of, of Bristol's population. What we want to do is actually say, hey, everyone's welcome and make it fun and engaging for everybody. So we need a low bar to entry so that we can get everyone on board. And we must have a clear value proposition for both businesses and individuals that makes sense in the current paradigm. You know, it's no good trying to talk to people in a paradigm they don't yet understand because they're not there. We have to make something which is easy and makes sense to people who are in the current, you know, like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I get my job and I go to the world. You know, they're, they're just living their lives completely within what is normal today. We then need to try and create some change and take people on a journey. We didn't really take people on a journey with Bristol Pound. If they thought about local economics, they were probably already trying to shop locally. And then we just gave some, them some special money, which made that more visible. But arguably, 
we didn't change enough behaviour. Most of the people that joined the Bristol Pound did it because they already believed in shopping locally. Ideally, we would operate at scale. I'm just going to open the window because it's second the sun's come out and it's hot. Um, we need to be able to operate at scale partly so that we can make an impact with Bristol Pound. Maybe we, maybe we did change a little bit of behaviour here and there. But when you're only working with 0.02% of the population, that is never going to be visible. It's never going to shift the dial on anything. Um, but also, we never were viable in our own right at Bristol Pound to to um, earn enough money from um, digital payment charges to cover the costs of the operation. We would have needed to be between 50 and 100 times the number of transactions and and um, and um, value of transactions that we were achieving. And without that mass marketing thing, we were never going to get that. And also our little infrastructure with BCU would never have, it would never have withstood, you know, 50X, 100X growth. You know, it was, it was far too clunky to cope with that kind of scaling up. Um, so we needed better tech and that ability to, to operate at scale. Um, we need to be fun and engaging and we must not make life more difficult to people. And we must have access to our data, not not be tracked um, with another organization such that we can't even see our transactions. So that was the kind of starting point. And then I had a kind of really early light bulb moment, which is that what we have to do if we're going to do something like this is separate out the what we really want to do and how we onboard people. If we tell people, look, we're trying to make you all greener and make the world better, but you know, then we're only going to talk to people who already understand that goal. And that was what we did with Bristol Pound. It's not just Bristol Pound, by the way. I would say Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, you know, a lot of a lot of these kind of social movements, they start off with a, you know, this is important, this is what we think, come on board, you know. And so all the people who think like that come on board, and then they get very kind of rah, rah, rah. And everyone go, goes, whoa, you know, I, whoa, they're a bit, they're a bit full on, and and they're you know sitting in the road, and I can't get to my hospital appointment. You know, they they tend to alienate people rather than welcome people in and help people change their thinking. That they, in fact, they, I would say, they polarize thought rather than encompass and you know develop things. So that that was the big idea. I need a business and marketing proposition that works within the current paradigm. And that can and and the idea was the idea that came out of that is okay. Let's have a non-profit payment platform that raises funds the voluntary sector. This was a really good marketing ploy. We talked to to businesses big and small, um, and you know the big businesses, you know the the you know, big chains said, yeah, we really want um, something that makes it sound like we care about our local, uh, you know the the local area where we where where this shop is. And so having a payment method, which is saying, and, and this is raising funds for the, you know, the, this locality is really good for us. And local businesses were, were keen as well for more obvious reasons. And people got it. People were like, yeah, I, you know, I really care about the voluntary sector and I can see how underfunded they are. And I'm worried that my kids' youth club is going to close. Um, I'm worried that our local library is going to close. You know, we, we really need to get funds into, um, into the voluntary sector who are gradually picking up more and more of what local government used to do and local government on the whole can't afford to do it certainly in the UK and I, I suspect it might be similar in other places um but then what we would have so we'd have this kind of like oh yeah it's a it's a payment platform to raise funds to the voluntary sector but then on the back end we could do the stuff that we actually wanted to do um, and that is about trying to change behavior and make people understand on a on a different level what their impact is at a social, uh, environmental and economic level and how, how could they improve that impact. So this was how the, the business proposition was going to work. We were looking at closed loop payments um, facilitated in the UK by something called Electronic Money um, Institute regulations, EMI regulations. Um, and normally, when you go with your phone or your um, card to a shop and pay, you know, the money seems to magically leave your bank account and arrive in the, in the shop's bank account, which is in a completely different bank. Um, and 
you're, it's invisible to you, but actually the bank is, uh, the, um, the shop is paying a transaction charge and the transaction charge is basically paying for a load of third party infrastructure that helps bridge a path for that payment to leave your bank account and end up in their bank account. You've got, you know, Visa and MasterCard as card issuers. Um, you've got Google Pay, you've got Stripe and WorldPay, you know, the kind of the, the people that have the little bits of tech in the shop that are facilitating those. You've got PayPal um, and stuff for online payments as well. Um, but if we had all of that within one uh, electronic money institute um, with so that every person and every shop is on the one system, we don't need those, those third parties. It's just literally debit Diana, credit my favorite cafe. You know, it's it's a really simple journal entry with, with pretty much no cost to us. So, and in um, in Bristol, the amount of money being lost, this was in 2019, we estimated it a couple of different ways. The amount of money being lost um, to the local economy in transaction charges is about 60 million pounds. And we thought, wow, you know, let, let's say we got 10% of the of the transactions which with a really good marketing focus you know based on this is helping to pay for our voluntary sector in bristol we reckoned you know we reckon we could get that um after a few years and that's six million pounds a year that we could be um giving to the voluntary sector maybe five million after we've got our own costs out of the way uh and that that's significant for the voluntary sector you know that that dwarfs what the current main local funding body gives the local voluntary sector. So it felt like a really good idea that we could divert that 60 million pounds to social and environmental projects within the cities where it operated, you know, Bristol first. We also thought we could uh, improve on financial inclusion. A lot of people can't get bank accounts in the UK, mainly because they don't have the right bits of paper. You know, they don't have a passport because they're poor and they've not traveled. They don't have bills in their name because they're living in houses with multiple occupancy and they don't have bills in their name. They don't have a driving license because they can't afford to run a car and they can't afford driving lessons. Uh, and without some of these key bits of paper, um, they can't get bank money. And digital bank money is what you need if you want to shop around online for the cheapest, this, that and the other. It's what you need if you want to set up a direct debit, which is the cheapest way to pay for your electricity or gas or, you know, so actually there's a poverty premium and people are being excluded from di the digital financial economy, which is you know, detrimental to them. And because the EMI regulations have a much lower threshold for, uh, for anti-money laundering and know your customer, um, there would be a way of providing digital money to a lot more people. So that's the, that's the business, you know, the business thing that would make money and is easy to get. What is the thing that we wanted to do in the background that would try and change behavior? And this was really thinking about tokenomics. Um, and I want you to think about tokens in the broadest possible way. I am not talking about cryptocurrencies. In fact, I'm not talking about a currency as a method of purchase or exchange or trade at all. I'm thinking about tokens in, in two other ways. One is as a recognition of something. So this could be, you know, if I give you a bunch of flowers because I care about you, um, it, it doesn't actually make any difference whether I picked the flowers from my garden or from the wayside, um, or whether I spent 40 bucks for flowers and gave them to you. In fact, I prefer it and it will mean more to you if I've gone and picked a few flowers that cost me nothing. So this is not about financial value at all. This is about recognizing another value, in this case, friendship. Right? Or it's a thing that enables you to do something. So if I have one of these uh, tokens to use a trolley, I don't need to use a pound. In, in the UK, we have trolleys at supermarkets and often you have to put a pound coin in them. But if you don't have a pound coin and you have one of these on your key ring, you can use this instead. So it's taking the place of a pound. It's not a pound but it still enables me to do something that normally it takes a pound to do. So these are different ideas about tokens. And if we think about tokens and, and money, money is just a special sort of token. Money is a sort of token that has some extra properties that the tokens I was just talking about don't have. 
One is it's a kind of unit of account for financial transactions so that you know we know you know we can equate if you like a certain number of eggs with buying a kettle or a certain number of kettles with buying a house you know we, we can do this kind of maths because there's a unit of account it's very easy to carry an exchange so if you're needing to exchange stuff and trade is your mentality then it's a great thing to have it, it's durable apart from in periods of hyperinflation um, you know you put it in your bank and it's still there you know three months three years 10 years later, where it might have devalued slightly. Um, but it might not, it might have grown in value, right? It depends on interest rates and inflation. But the key thing is that money is a social construct and it is made for the market economy. And the problem with the market economy and this never ending growth of the market economy is that it is just rapaciously using resources, right? And uh, Alanis Obstwin, who is a um, uh, a filmmaker, a Canadian filmmaker, a native Canadian. Um, she addressed the United Nations. I think it was, I think it was actually in 1970. I think the book was printed in 72, where I got the quote from. And she said, when the last tree has been cut down and the last fish caught and the last river poisoned, only then will we realize that we cannot eat money. And, and this is key, right? Money is not a real value. Money tells us nothing about anything. It is a proxy of a thing which really has value. And we keep thinking that money is a thing that has value. And we keep thinking that we can use money to correct our current economic system. We keep thinking, well, maybe if we price in some of the externalities, you know, then magically we'll have resolved this. And so we've been you know, experimenting with carbon taxes and carbon credits now for 20, 25 years. It's done nothing. It's done nothing to even, you know, it's done nothing to CO2 emissions are continuing to rise at 16% a year. You know, when we're talking about, oh, we must renew, oh, aren't we doing well with, with um, you know, renewable energy? It's like, no, we're not. We're doing rubbish. You know, carbon dioxide emissions are continuing to increase at 16% a year as we speak. And um, so we cannot price this stuff in. The whole point of a market is that the prices will change and blah, blah, and everyone can carry on as normal. You know, uh, um, we need to think about the real values. So what are the real values? The real value is environmental capital, you know, uh, the quality of our air, water, soil, biodiversity. We need to think about social capital, about community cohesion, about human health, uh, uh, human well-being and culture. We need to think about knowledge, making sure that people are ed educated, that, that we have creativity, which has been you know, educated out of most of the people within many Western um, um, systems of education, that adaptability that is going to enable us to, to be resilient in the face of things like climate change. We need to understand the value of already manufactured capital, because without maintaining those, investing it, it doesn't give us a springboard for the next thing. We need to count the actual capitals, not the money instead. And until we do that, we aren't going to really change our economic system in any meaningful way. So Bristol Pay or City Pay was going to be an experiment in starting to get used to trying to spot, measure and count and make fun interacting with other capitals. So one of the first ideas we had was a thanks token. And the idea of the thanks token is that you would get a universal basic income of thanks tokens, you know, maybe topped up to 10 a day. And you've got kind of two sides to the game, if you like. One is you're trying to spend your, your thanks, you're trying to recognize random acts of kindness, you know, that either people you know or people you never met have done for you. You know, um, you know, my shopping fell apart as I was crossing the road and, you know, someone helped me do stuff. I could kind of, you know, say, hey, here's a, you know, a, a thank you for you know, the community of Bristol, um, you know, and with a little, a little bit of metadata in there that we could store on the token saying, you know, helped me, you know, helped me at a moment of need kind of thing. Um, Equally, it might go to an individual and individuals could could then you know, get that this is a, a token which this person has earned, if you like, by doing a nice thing, by popping to the chemist for this person who who can't who couldn't go. Um, and so they're feeling good about themselves because they're seeing that they have um, scored these points in a game, if you like, that they're doing well. Um, equally, the tokens can degrade over time and so we can start to say you know if you want to keep that level of feeling good about yourself you're going to have to keep doing this behavior 
you might think this is a bit like a let's a local exchange trading system if you've come across that michael linton's um you know schemes that got set up all around the world um that have largely fallen into disuse i would say now it's not the same because with let's you have to earn before you can spend it's still a market earn and spend mentality this is not a market as i'm pointing at my screen um, maybe, maybe it's this side for you i don't know um this is not a market earn and spend mentality because everyone has got limitless access to thanks tokens uh, and you can't do anything with a thanks token. You know, if I've got lots of these thanks tokens because I've been a lovely person, doesn't mean I get a free latte or I can get a discount at a local store. No, they're, they're completely separate to a market approach. Um, we thought about you know, others. You, know, you, you could use a similar thing for volunteering as well. And you know, these are having impacts, they're reducing isolation, they're building social cohesion. Um, they each have their own um, um, dynamics in terms of how each token can operate. But the key thing is they're all trying to do something. Voting was a key one. We wanted a voting token that could help um, help democratize decision making around the city. You know, these days, especially in the UK, maybe different where you are, people don't go and vote in local elections. People don't go along to their local voluntary organization and go to the AGM and make resolutions. And you know, so, so a lot of a lot of decision makers are making decisions in the absence of really knowing what people think. And, and I think this explains a lot of the anger and frustration that makes it very easy for then certain politicians to use fear and distrust and, you know, they don't care about you as kind of narratives around their political campaigns. Because, yeah, it's true that, you know, people are not participating enough. So, you know, using this to increase that sense of democracy is important badges to recognize you know achievements and skills that um so extinction rebellion for example does um does training regularly with with volunteers um around de-escalation and i was thinking wow if if we managed to make de-escalation a kind of you know popular training course imagine the impact that could have on accident and emergency admissions you know and uh, police interventions you know with um you know, brawls or fights or disagreements in the street or in the pub, you know, people would feel more empowered and know how to intervene to take the heat out of those situations. You know, so that would be a great thing to kind of recognize on the platform. Active miles to help with the, you know, the shift in, in how we transition. Reuse, so, um, here's another thing showing how a reuse token might work, where you could associate a token with a particular thing. I think this is a power screwdriver. Um, and maybe I've bought a power screwdriver. I've put it, I've put up my shelves, and then I put the power screwdriver in the attic. And you know, this is what tends to happen. You then get it out four years later when you next need to put up some shelves. And funnily enough, the thing is seized up. It doesn't work anymore, or you've forgotten you've got it, and so you buy a new one. And so there are stats out there showing that, in fact, the average uh, power, I think it's a power drill, actually, these stats, the average power drill gets used four minutes before it gets sent to landfill four minutes you know and clearly that is an absolute waste of the carbon and material resource that goes into making the power drill so each time the the um in this case our screwdriver gets passed on the the, the token associated with the with the screwdriver can can add one and you can imagine kind of fun league tables of you know who's got the best screwdriver in town, you know, because it, it's been it's had the most uses, it's been repaired the most times, it's it's put up the most shelves or whatever. You know, so we could start to use data to really drive engagement in a different way. So what really determines our behavior? Well, it turns out it's not really extrinsic rewards. There's a lot of research out there that shows that financial incentives don't really work. They might work in the short term, but in the longer term, because the financial incentives, you know, like there are little schemes to encourage recycling or whatever, you know, where you get um, actually the, the level of incentive never really matches the level of effort you've put in. It's not like a wage. And so pe if people are thinking, oh, I'm doing this for economic reasons and the economic reasons don't make sense, they quickly stop doing the work. I would point to you at uh, Dan Ariely and James Heyman, who have done a lot of work on social economy around this, and, and it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, 
people make more offer, offer when volunteering than when being rewarded at a below market rate. Again, that's that comes directly out of Ariely and Heyman's work. Um, the other thing I would point out is the individual and social and material um, model of behaviour change, which says that what determines how we behave is what we think about ourselves, our emotional um, understanding and our beliefs about you know who we are, what kind of person we are, how we want to be in the world, um, as well as perhaps something around you know can I bothered today or you know um, then there's the social stuff around norms. You know, if I, I'm not going to do something that I think everyone's going to go, whoa, that's a bit weird. Um, people want to fit in and do things that are consistent with their social roles and identities. And then there's the infrastructure, you know, materially, what can I do? Legally, what can I do? So if we're thinking about how do we get someone off, you know, out of a car and onto a bus, there's lots of things that we need that person to think about. We need that person, first of all, not to be thinking, yeah, well, I'm not really a bus kind of person. You know, let's say this is a, let, let's say this person over here is a top shot, you know, corporate lawyer. And he, you know, he's got an image of himself like, yeah, I'm, I'm somebody, you know, I'm professional. Um, you know, I want to, I want people to view me as professional. And frankly, you know, I'm a bit above going on the bus. And uh, and socially, he's thinking, I want to be respected. If I go into a meeting and say, sorry, I'm five minutes late. The number 42 was a bit late coming down the high street. Um, they're, they're just going to think I can't afford a decent car. They're going to laugh at me. Um, and until this person is thinking, oh, no, it looks better if I say I came on the bus. And that makes me look like I'm socially responsible, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and until he's thinking, actually, I am a bus person and buses are cool. And by talking about going by bus, I am, you know, showing who I am and I'll be respected by other people. He's not going to look at a bus timetable. So we need to understand this, these different understandings about behavior. So just sort of wrapping up now, I'm sorry, I know I've, I've spent a bit longer than my, the 15 minutes that I've said. These tokens are not about earning and spending and they're not about purchasing power. They're much more like the steps on your Fitbit, which are just your personal data and you're excited about because you want to be the best you can be. They're like your Facebook likes or your retweets, or I mean, I'm not on TikTok, but I'm sure there's something similar on there, which makes you feel like, hey, yeah, my peers like me, I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm a bit like this other cool person. I'm doing the same things they're doing. And um, um, it's like, and with Duolingo is doing a similar thing and Duolingo are beginning to use that data, not, not for, you know, just for marketing, which is unfortunately where the business model behind the Facebook thing works. So I guess what I'm trying to say is these things like Fitbit and Facebook and Duolingo, they're clearly working at changing behavior. Unfortunately, they're not doing it from a point of we're trying to make the world a better place. They're doing it from a point of, you know, how do I you know, keep people's eyes on the screen and, and, and sell loads of marketing stuff? Or how do I sell more add-ons to the Fitbit? Or how do I uh, you know, get more people onto the Duolingo thing. And, and Duolingo are, are capturing some overall data, like, you know, there are more people um, learning uh, Scandinavian uh, languages than, than speak Scandinavian. I, I don't know. You know. They've got a load of stats on there, which are kind of useful or interesting. But imagine if instead that we were saying, for example, one of, one of the tokens we were thinking of was a three-minute shower challenge. And we could then have data so, so you could look at your own challenge and maybe share that with a few friends saying, oh, you know, I've done 10 days in a row of the, uh, having a three minute shower challenge. But as well, we could publicize data like in Bristol at the moment today, 3,800 people are doing a three minute shower challenge. And over the last month, we estimate that we've saved this many gallons of water and this many therms of gas to heat that water up to, um, to, to temperature. And that's having a, a significant effect, um, you know, impact by our combined effort. So this is a way of um, of trying to get people to collaborate. Um, I'll just skip through these. So basically people are being rewarded with tokens for doing socially or environmentally useful things and business as well, potentially. And the reason they're doing it is just to feel good about themselves um, and you know, making, you know, making it visible to themselves and feeling part of a movement um, where you know, the people can't look at my data unless I share it, but at an anonymized level, 
it's starting to tell a story about behavior change across the city and making people feel part of it. At the moment, if I put up my hand and say, I'm trying to be green, and I say that publicly on Facebook, I'm going to have a load of, oh, it's just made this, <laughs> thinks I'm putting my hand up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it did that. That's very that's very clever of of, um, of Zoom. Um, uh, it's I make it go away. I don't know how to do that. I have to wait till the end of the presentation. Um, uh, I've forgotten now. I've, I've interrupted myself and lost my train of thought. Oh yes, if I say I'm trying to make a difference, immediately I'm going to have a load of trolls and people going, "Yeah, I saw you ate a beef burger. I saw you get on an aeroplane, and blah blah blah." And you're not so bloody perfect. And so there's this, you know, calling out of hypocrisy that is just damaging anyone's ability to feel good about themselves for making whatever effort they're making. The reality is no one within our current paradigm can live a blame-free life, right? We all have to, sadly, engage with the market economy. That probably means we're going to have to do some stuff that is not making the world a better place, like, I don't know, get a marketing job or something. Um, um, read read David Graeber's bullshit jobs, please. Um, and um, and and then spend it at supermarkets on on ultra processed food because you know actually today I can't get to, I can't make myself dinner from scratch and I couldn't go and buy my organic vegetables or the veg box scheme didn't deliver you know it's just we are we can never be perfect in the current system but we need some data that helps us at least move in the right direction we need a tipping point and we think that this kind of data could help create those tipping points where people go oh, okay it's normal to try and take a three minute challenge you know, th there's a reason for doing this and if we could through this kind of platform create that feeling of these are the emerging new normals we could really shift things quickly and you know this is just to give you an idea of, of how we need to change that normality the, this garden on the right here that looks overgrown people got evicted from the house associated with this garden in the UK. It was about, um, I think it was about 18 months ago uh, when I did these slides. And they were evicted for not caring for their garden. This is a blameless garden for, you know, there's no chemicals being used here. It's great for carbon capture. It's great for insects. It's a fabulous garden. Uh, however, it was enough to get people evicted. No one's get, going to get evicted from this house because of this garden, which is thoroughly neat. It is dead. It requires constant spraying with chemicals to keep it this bad. Um, it's doing nothing for carbon capture. It's doing nothing for water, you know, avoiding water runoff. It's dreadful, but it is socially acceptable. Somehow we need to shift what is socially acceptable to different things. So yeah, we wanted to create this platform. We wanted to have a kind of cooperative structure with city pay and with the local implementations in different cities. We wanted each of these to be community benefit societies that were focused on, on the communities where they were with a kind of democratic using the voting token system to ensure that the development of the system uh, kept in track. Um, so yeah, in short, the idea behind Bristol Pay was that it would be a financial tool and a payment platform to, to raise money for the voluntary sector, but more importantly, it was going to be a highly experimental tool around shifting social norms using tokens to recognize different sorts of value not financial value and at that point i will at long last shut up and apologize for speaking too long no thank you very much Diana. that was really great i enjoyed it immensely and uh, i managed to lower your hand <laughs> i figured out how to be able to do that but i've never seen it work like that automatically which thank is you. really cool um so I mean, there's so many challenges associated with trying to do something like this. And it seemed to me that um, you so you were trying to make it sort of easy, uh, easy to enter this, this scheme. Um, so uh, the lowest um, acts entry barrier possible. And I think often uh, we see that many in, in so, I guess it's in the commercial sector, the way they play it is basically um, they want your data. Your data is very, very attractive for them. So they actually want you, first of all, they'll offer you a free service uh, for whatever it is. For instance, I cycle, I use Strava, and I've got the free service there. But they just want to see where I cycle. 
that they can make money out of that. So that's one one part of it. And um, and that maybe in a sense was enough for, as a start point. Um, is that? But uh, but I suspect you had a you had a much you had a much bigger vision, but using people's data for that for whatever reason and making money out of it to fund your activity wasn't something that you wanted to do right no no definitely not that, that we did not want the we did not want the data to be the commodity apart from that kind of overall data that is driving social change but not commercially commercially there was no you know we wanted to protect that data from any commercial use at all Okay, I understand. Um, I mean, there was one thing that just came to my mind as you, as you were talking was that, and and it's based a little bit on the an application we have in Japan called Line. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It started out as basically uh, like WhatsApp, a communication tool, and then it it's added functions over time. And um, it is commercial, and and so there is a pay. There's line pay, and then there's also uh, you have the you have the communications tool, but then you also have a kind of a guide, a guide to wherever you are, what's available, and so on. Um, now the idea isn't that you'd make something like line, but that you'd have something that's sort of ethically guided <laughs> by the right kinds of people who have an application that is about, well, I love Bristol and I love everything about Bristol and I want to basically be part of Bristol life. And uh, and then what you do is over time, you gradually put in more things like the tokens and so on. But maybe initially it's like getting to know Bristol, getting to enjoy Bristol, eating organic food in Bristol, um, at, participating in educational programs and so on. I wonder if that would be something that yeah. could Yeah, I mean, that, that wasn't what we were doing because we didn't we didn't want to go down the route of, you know, having a, a directory of business members and, you know, where, where you're trying to encourage yourself. We wanted it to be completely open. So um, it was, you know, the pure marketing thing is use Bristol Pay wherever you can, shops please accept Bristol Pay because it is raising money for the voluntary sector in Bristol. Um, and we did look at trying to launch just the payments first and we did, in fact, we spent a few months with a payment provider trying to work that up, thinking then we'll add the tokens later. Unfortunately, they had their own investment problems and it all got a bit stuck and, and we had to leave. But also one of the reasons I think that we we ended that partnership um, when we did was because they were starting to say, yeah, well, may maybe we'll do the tokens, but we're not terribly interested in that. And and to me, it's like, there's no point. I don't, I'm not, yes, okay, I'm interested in raising money for the voluntary sector. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but actually the voluntary sector is not the answer. And in many ways, the voluntary sector is the papering over the cracks that uh, justifies the continuation of our current dreadful economic system that creates all the problems that the charities are then trying to correct for. Yeah. So I, I'm I, I'm not I'm not interested in funding charities per se, and that is not my end game. So I I didn't want to work with a payment company who already before we even got going was saying, yeah, well the token stuff is a bit pointless and maybe we won't do it. Yeah, and there's no way you could lock them in. Uh, to to ensure it happens, yeah. Um, unless you have some kind, well, you'd have to try to lock them in. That would be the main thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, with the agreement with them at the beginning. If anybody else has a question, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, feel free to raise any point. Okay, Christian. I guess maybe now that you've learned from the past, is there other plans for the future, like to re-implement it? Or as I say, I, I I can't raise any funding. I would love to do this experiment or a similar one, um, but um, I think the problem really is that this, you know, the Bristol Pay City Pay idea is focused on a new way of thinking about. You know, other capitals other than financial. You know, it's it. 
it does you know it fits a little bit into the current paradigm you know with that kind of um entry point being oh you know let's raise money for the voluntary sector um however by calling it a non-profit payment platform that immediately means that nobody really wants to invest in setting it up because they're not going to get a return on investment so it, the only way to fund it would be through voluntary sector funding and voluntary sector funders uh, were kind of saying that, well they would ask questions like how many people with poor mental health in Bristol are going to have better mental health in three years as a result of your project or how you know, and these are not you know like well maybe it will it's hard to know what the you know, until I decide which tokens we're doing which depends on what people vote for you know uh, or what what charities want to get involved with with our work it's really hard to say um, so I, I found it very difficult to get funding within the current paradigm because we're working in a completely different paradigm. And so, yeah, I mean, I'd love to do it, but I have no idea how to do it. I've spent three years trying to, trying to work out how to do it and, and ultimately failed. So, I mean, I've had to get another job um, to pay the bills. I'm going to be writing the book of, of all of this stuff, which will go into a bit more detail. I mean, you probably could tell I could talk about this all day. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll write the book, and I hope that someone else will find a way of doing something similar. Because you know, ultimately, I guess what I really believe is that planet Earth is a commons. You know, there's you know eight billion or however many of us, and one planet Earth, and we want it. To, we want our children, our children's children, to to have a functioning Earth by the time it gets to them that is able to meet their basic needs. Uh, and at the moment we're in severe jeopardy of that not being the case, but most people are just carrying on not knowing. And we have a governance system for planet Earth called the global market economy, um, which is a way of distributing the resources of planet Earth to the people, right? I mean, if, that's the, if that's the aim, how do we use the resources of planet Earth to make a sustainable future for the people and all life on Earth? Then we currently have completely the wrong governance system in a global market economy. What we need is a global commons economy. Uh, and to do that, we're going to have to start to think about things other than financial value. We're gonna to have to think about you know, responsibility and um, creation of values, environmental value, social value, you know, values outside of financial value uh, and that could be the basis of a commons economy. But that is going to take, you know, it, it's taken 500 years from, you know, little kind of small scale local trade and exchange to get to a global economy, right? It's going to take at least 500 years to go from experiments like Bristol Pay to, oh yeah, we have a global commons economy. It's not going to happen overnight. I don't know if we've got 500 years, frankly, the, the state the world is in. But I hope that the people who are working on um, sorry, I'm talking a lot again. I think there are two aspects to, to new economic thinking. One set of people are working on, okay, how do we do uh, you know, localization and set up more co-ops and um, improve regulation and look at carbon trading and blah, blah, blah. And how do, we, you know, how do we massage the current global economic system into something which is a bit less bad and might buy us some time? Or I think they think it might solve it, but I don't. I'm thinking maybe that work can buy us just about enough time to create the global commons economy which is not a market economy. Yeah, you know, that that 500 year transition, um, you know, is a long thing, but we have to start somewhere. We have to start doing some experiments now with how do we create a new governance system for planet Earth? I think experiments, the key word. We, that's what we've been looking at in this course. I mean, we although we have the big picture in mind, uh, we're essentially talking about urban living and I think one of the things about the Bristol pound that you identified earlier on was how much wealth is leaving the community leaves the the city and as a result of that the city many parts of the city end up being deprived and I think you've done a lot of work in that area around deprivation and so on so I think um you know I, the, the digital currency, the idea like Bristol Pay is part of a jigsaw puzzle of things that need to fall into place in, in the city. And it just didn't work out that puzzle this time around for you. But the, 
but it might be that in another city you have a few things that are happening at the same time, such as, and you did mention UBI, you know, so somewhere where you've actually got a UBI experiment taking place at the same time as you've got uh, community wealth building happening, and then you've got the sharing economy uh, people working as well, and that they're all kind of coordinating with each other, and then somehow it it starts it starts to change the dynamic and it changes it away from like this uh city will constantly be struggling and have to compete um, or die to a situation where the city is actually prospering and maintaining uh you know a, a socially inclusive and relatively equitable situation across the city with a localized economy and that city then doesn't need to it is you know it's a good place to live and you can live well and i think what we're happen, happening in many places is that it's not a good place to live and a lot of people are really struggling partly because of this you know the way the global economy works and some of these you know pay systems that just uh, take suck the wealth out you know um you look at high streets across the uk they're all in, many of them are in decline and shuttered and, and really in a bad condition. So we do need to fix that part as well. And I think that is what maybe motivates a lot of people to- I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. I mean, what I would say is that, yes, there are a lot of people thinking, you know, our, our little town could do with something like this to help regenerate the blah, blah, blah. That is still coming from a growth perspective. Um, and it's still coming from a, you know, how do we improve the, the you know it's the you know when I was saying the two bits of work it's still part of how do we improve the current market economy to make it a bit less bad and I can see yeah you know, that work is important but I'm much more interested in experiments that are looking at other forms of capital non-exchange I'll just um we probably have to wind up soon I don't know how long you've got but just to to draw a difference yeah, you know, we haven't always had money as human society. It's not it's not needed. We don't have to do everything through trade and exchange. Uh, there are other ways that we could organize. It's difficult to imagine them because at the moment this is ubiquitous. But for example, when we bring up our children and we, you know, we give them love, resources, you know, we spend a lot of money on them. We, you know, we, we, it's a it's a one way thing. It is the strongest possible um relationship you can have in return what you get as a parent between the ages of about five and 12 is two badly drawn cards every year um and there is no equality of exchange that is not what it's about we do not need to have a global system that is based on ideas you know we hear it in the in the press of it you know there's this idea of the deserving poor or the undeserving poor well yeah i i'm afraid i don't i don't see any distinction at all. If you are one of the people who is unfortunate enough to be classed as undeserving because you have had a, a dreadful childhood, you have not been given the opportunity, you know, your, your parents were very poor, you weren't looked after in school, the health system let you down, you know, you, uh, and, and then you are blamed for that failure and your inability for whatever reason to engage in our current ridiculous system where you have to go and work for someone else doing something pointless again bullshit jobs just to keep the economic machine going and be on the hamster wheel uh, the hamster wheel which is destroying our planet you know i so i'm i'm a, i'm i'm interested in degrowth how do we get away from the market economy how do we not focus on oh equality of money okay ubi is is going to be a stepping stone i'm sure to avoid the need for people to do bullshit jobs and to look at a, a, a strategy for degrowth. Uh, but we need to start now to, to invent and experiment with ideas that are not based on trade and exchange. Nearly all the work on the new economy is looking at how do we make strange, trade and exchange a bit better? It's mutual currencies and mutual credit or whatever, or it's you know, cooperatives, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm interested in, we need to do experiments in now that are okay, maybe coming off the back of those some of those experiments that are local currencies and things like like we were, but how do we start to to do, create some very different thinking about what it means to be human and live in relation to the planet? 
Great. Well, I mean, I think it's important to be look, look super ambitious. <laughs> Maybe we should, um, you know, try to embrace uh, a totally radical uh, rethink of where we and and the sooner the better because time is is against us. Anyone else have any comments, feedback, impressions? Okay, um, Peter. Uh, it's not really a question, but rather like an observation. Uh, first of all, thank you. It was amazingly clear. <laughs> um, I was just like wondering whether this type of system would maybe work better in a developing country rather than Western countries, since like a lot of local loops of like local economy still exist. They're being destroyed because the country is like building up, trying to enrich themselves and stuff. But uh, in the case of Morocco, I could see something like this developing quite successfully because it would just be in phase with something that still kind of is struggling to survive and it will also like enrich this thing that is disappearing at this moment. So, yeah. <laughs> I think I think you might be right. And there is a lot of local currency work going on. Um, I'm mean, going to point you at Will Ruddick, who is doing, you know, with grassroots economics, doing a lot of stuff across Africa with um, with highly localized digital currencies. I mean, it's still he's still working on trade. Right. And I think this is a thing that we we very much, uh, you know, and I know you've been looking at donut economics and you know, I think Kate Rayworth talks a lot about the, the kinds of um, evidence that we have that for countries that are that are still developing, that growing GDP actually does still um, um, improve social provision. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas in already developed countries like the UK, continued growth does nothing to help the, the lowest in society um, have a better life. In fact, it, it tends to do the opposite. It, it, you know, inequality increases. So, um, so yes, I'm sure you're right, and I'm sure that we could help instead. Of, you know, ideally, instead of helping those developing countries get, you know, develop their market economy to be as bad as ours, it would be really lovely to get in there early on and say, let's try and do some of this commons work, you know, there um, before, you know, so they don't have to go down this ridiculous route. I guess I had designed the kind of tokens around Bristol Pay, City Pay around trying to make people within developed societies aware of the negative impacts and to learn experientially about how they could you know, behave differently to, you know, by making visible some of those other capitals and how they're affected by what they do. So um, I, I think you're right. I think it, it could have, but it would probably look quite different. I think the kinds of tokens would be very different in different, in different areas. But yes, I, I, I definitely see this kind of experiment as needed all over the world. And I, I, I kind of have a vision that in 500 years time, you know, instead of you know, OECD and the United Nations looking at different countries' GDP, they'd be looking at their social tokens and their environmental tokens and um, you know, trying to understand which countries are actually um, doing, doing the right stuff and which countries are, are completely failing and need, you know, need sanctions or supports to to you know to to change how they operate so yeah and I, I think it's a really valid point thank you Gita. thank you okay. yeah thank you Gita. any any anyone else have a comment or a question okay alex yeah um it's it's, it's really interesting i i really find this interesting so my my only question is like how I guess it's like, how do you convince people? I guess I'm not phrasing the question right, but for example, like Apple Pay, I can just kind of like tap like that. So do you kind of envision it to be a similar way where it's just like, it's in my wallet and I just, okay, okay, sorry. That's the piece I was missing. Okay. So, okay, got it. Thanks. Sorry. I was just confused about that for a while. My yeah, no, the, the aim would be for that payment method to be just as simple as Apple Pay. Okay. Uh, you know, so if you're in a shop that takes it and you've got it on your phone, you just say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll pay with, with, with City Pay. And that way, you know, I'm helping the local voluntary sector. Meanwhile, on your account, I'm, yeah, I've, I've got another 
thing which I could show, which it was kind of like a a visualization of what it might look like. So that then when you're on there, you can see your your kind of money on the one hand, and on the other hand, you can see um, you know, like you, a summary of your tokens. So mm. like, you know, your your three minute shower tokens right. or your, you know, whatever, and you could go into those and 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 be you know, suggested new games or challenges that you could try, like um, digging up a square meter of your garden and rewilding it, um, um, or, or whatever. So yeah, it would it would be both. But the idea is that um, yeah, that the payment thing would be just as easy. And then we kind of just nudge people towards a kind of Fitbit for their entire life. Um, on the other hand, interesting. So it's easy to use for them to use it, and then once they're in the system, then they get to explore all of the interesting that makes more sense Th thank you very much thank you yeah oh you can see the potential of it and as a fitbit wearer i can understand how you motivate people uh through this kind of approach and i think that's that's really really important part of what you were trying to do because there is this other uh school of thought is that you should ban behaviors and um you know for instance ban cars in the city center and i mean i actually like that idea but the reaction you get is a lot of negativity and conflict so maybe banning isn't the, w the way to go but having something like a token that motivates somebody um, to give up their car might be a much much better approach and i think that's the path that you are on um yeah yep yeah. anyone else got any comments or questions we're getting very close to the end of the time Sorry, I have a quick question. Hi, Gabby. Hey. Um, yeah, I really like the... Sorry, I'll turn my um, video on so you can see me. Um, I really like the presentation here. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, I was just wondering if you've thought about how... Oh, well, I suppose you probably have, but how would wages work in this kind of system? Well, in the, in the long term, I, I don't believe in a wage economy. I don't believe in jobs as the, you know, I'm fight in my perfect future, 500 years down the line, when we have a commons economy, it is not, it, you know, people's labor is, is not something that I see being rewarded by a unit of value called money and, and then purchasing things. So it, it's really, you know, I don't know what I do see quite, but it's, it's a different paradigm. It's a different way of thinking. You know, people didn't used to have, jobs that were you know paid for by big business I, you know the idea of a business I don't, you know, there are so many the idea of private ownership of land you know like there are all of these things which to me should not be part of that future economic system but to ask me to pick apart any one of them say well how would this bit be and how would that bit be it's like well I don't know but we need to start trying to think about that and trying to experiment with how we could do things different. And that there are people, you know, there are people setting up land trusts, you know, there are people living in communities where, you know, where they don't pay each other for work, but they're all working together and they're all, you know, sharing the food, you know, and they're not thinking, well, I haven't been paid. And, you know, actually, um, you know, I, he's got more potatoes than me and, you know, I did two more hours of work. You know, that, that's not how those communities work at all. So one of the things that was inspiring to me was um, I heard about a, um, uh, oh God, I've forgotten it. Oh, what are they called? Um, Neanderthal community that they had found, you know, dug up in an archeological dig. And they, one of the, one of the, you know, one of the skeletons was um, a male about 40, 45 years old. And it was clear that he had been completely disabled, um, unable to, you know, to, to walk around and things from probably age 10, some kind of accident. And, you know, they looked after him. He hadn't been able to, to work or whatever, you know, but they had clearly cared for him and valued him as a member of the community. Um, you know, that's what being human is about. Uh, we seem to have moved quite a long way away from that in in our modern societies and think that uh, you know some people do deserve help and some people don't deserve help and uh and that it's yeah a, it to me it is it is criminal that we have homeless people in the UK thousands and thousands of homeless people we have we have millions of people resorting to food banks eating the most crap food you know 
over uh, yeah, ultra processed foods created by manufacturers who are creating low value food um, cheaply um, because I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, so much is wrong and <laughs> it's hard to know where to begin. And you know, it all needs completely unpicking, but that will need to be done very gradually through a variety of, of combinations. But you know, Bristol Pay, though, initially that does nothing. You know, it, Bristol Pay fits in the current system and is just then, you know, on the back end of it is this experiment about um, about multiple capitals and about experiential learning about our greater, you know, our wider impacts than just. Yeah, hopefully that would lead to other experiments and other experiments. It's not the solution. It's not that this would solve all the problems. It is just, yeah, how do we get started on some of that work? where we don't focus on money, which isn't really a value, and focus on the things that are values. Yeah, I think the, uh, the radical experimentation, embracing radical experimentation across the board is probably the mindset that we need going forward from here, um, especially because there's a lot coming down um, on top of us, such as climate change, such as artificial intelligence, automation, automation and so on so if we get fixated <laughs> yeah, um, we probably just will we'll just cr uh, crash rather than be able to ride that wave to wherever it, we need to go and um, you did mention um, Grave, David Graver's book a couple of times and recommend recommended reading for everybody bullshit jobs um, it's really fantastic unfortunately he's no longer with us um, but a uh, great guy, great book. And uh, Diana, you mentioned it, so I thought I would share that and encourage the students to to look into it. So we're, we're just at the end of uh, time now. I don't know. Um, do you have any kind of parting message for us before we end? Oh, well, um, I'm really pleased that you're all doing this course. I hope that it is helping you think critically and innovatively about how we do this you know i'm i'm 58 you know I'm, I'm i'm too old probably to make anything really change at this point but you guys are at the beginning and um yeah please think about your power to shift the system um it doesn't take many people to create massive change all of the massive changes that we've seen in the world have started from a few people doing some stuff so i i really wish you all the best in your careers and Hope that you will all be bold, brave, innovative, and not care that people laugh about you and say, "What? Well, that's a ridiculous idea!" Like, how you know? How are we going? You know, like, just just be brave to to have those crazy ideas and uh, and experiment. Thank you. And maybe we can give the final word to to a student. Would anybody like to give some final reflection? Do I need to call on somebody? I'm looking to see who's uh, Craig. You haven't said anything. Do you have a, a comment just to wrap up for us here? Well, I know that uh, it's it's a it's a new topic to me. I've actually never heard of the the Bristol Pound. I was surprised how successful it was. Is actually a great project. I thought, and now this new moving forward, uh, motivating these towns to look away from how can this profit me, and instead look on like how can this like be good for the world is is it shouldn't be a hard task but it is very difficult and so i i respect the work that's going into this um and uh yeah i wish you luck it's very complicated yeah good, good luck with the book book i would def i'm definitely looking forward to reading that and we we'll just have to say thank you diana for a really inspirational talk no problem. I'll I'll uh, send you the slides and um, yeah and and if any of you want to contact me yeah you know, but um, then you'll feel free.